Hello and welcome to this video all about fixing your muddy mixes. Hope you're doing incredibly well. This is part three of the one month EQ challenge. So go sign up to that below if you haven't already. And today you're gonna to learn all about how to prevent and fix a muddy mix. And it's a really common problem, especially with a typical rock band setup. But as soon as you're aware of the ways that you can prevent and fix uh, the problem of mud in your mix, and really clears up your mixes, gives them more definition, gives them more uh, room for the for the good stuff to shine through and more kind of clarity in there as well. So really good benefits to fix in muddy mixes. If you haven't watched the other two parts of this series, I recommend you go watch them. In part one, we covered the foundations of EQ and the four key approaches, and you need to have a good foundational knowledge before you can move on to this stuff. And then in part two, you learned all about separation and clarity. And that's kind of relevant to mud, but it's a different problem, so that was part two. And a couple of things from that that I just want to reiterate. First of all, you need a good listening environment, or you at least need to know your listening environment. You, it helps if you have acoustic treatment and a, well, a pair of actual studio monitors. Uh, or a good pair of open back headphones, for example. But if you don't have those, you can still get good mixes. You just need to really learn your equipment. Which brings me on to point two, which is make sure you use references when you're EQing. Compare your mix to a professionally mixed, mastered and released track and that will help you to kind of, well, that will guide you towards making the right EQ decisions and give you something to compare your mix to to decide if it's too bright, too bassy, etc. So two key things I wanted to reiterate there. Now let's move on to muddy mixes and how you can prevent and fix uh, mud from being a problem in your mix. And first of all, I just want to give you a quick demonstration of how a muddy mix actually sounds. And I'm just going to do this by boosting um, the, the frequency range which is usually the problem and I find it's generally between two and four hundred sometimes 500 sometimes a bit lower than 200 but generally it's between two and four hundred so if I center a band at 300 make it quite wide uh, and boost this I'm going to play it in bypass so you can hear the track normally and I'm going to bring this in when you see that up here you're listening to that EQ boost and instantly it's going to sound more muddy everything's going to uh, lose its definition you're not going to be able to pinpoint the different instruments as much uh, and it's just going to sound a bit clogged up uh, have a listen tell me is this too much to handle conversation don't know where to go feeling like a slow burning candle the end is inevitable so let's make that even more exaggerated just so you can really hear how that frequency range sounds tell me is this too to handle conversation don't know where to go feeling like a slow candle so that's the frequency range that you want to address with your EQ EQ moves but before we talk about that I want to go back to the root of the problem and it's generally an arrangement problem we spoke about this in part two when we when you learn about separation um, and when you're arranging a piece, you want to think about both instrumentation and also the register and octave that the different parts play in. Because if you have lots of uh, parts playing in that area, in that lower mid area, in the same octave, maybe you have three guitars all playing in the same octave or even different instruments but playing in that same register, of course there's going to be a build up of frequencies in that area. So if you think about a string quartet, it's a cello to provide the low end, viola to provide the middle, and two violins to provide the top end, but generally they'll be doing different things. So you've got a really nice spread across the whole frequency spectrum with four different instruments. But now think about a typical rock band setup. You've got a drum kit with the main uh, parts being the kick and the snare. Then you've got a bass guitar, a rhythm guitar, sometimes a lead guitar as well, an acoustic guitar, a piano maybe, male vocals or female vocals, uh, you could even have keyboard parts, it quickly builds up and a lot of those instruments are focused around that low mid area. The fundamentals of those instruments are around that area. So you get a build up there and you can think about this when you're composing. You can think rather than getting <clears throat> free guitars to play uh, chords and a melody in the same octave, put them an octave apart. But there's an inherent problem with that rock band setup that it's hard to avoid and generally it does kind of cause muddy mixes and especially when you're recording at home as well uh, the kind of microphones you're going to be using the microphone techniques you're using might add to that muddiness so it's a common problem now you can fix it first of all by addressing that arrangement if you if you have that ability 
But a lot of the time we also need to use EQ to further remove that mud uh, and, and treat that problem. So now let's go over the three ways that you can fix and remove or at least reduce muddiness in your mix. Number one is pretty simple, don't boost this frequency range. And now that may seem obvious, uh, but a lot of people will boost the low mids if they want to make something sound warmer. But instead of doing that, I'd say cut the highs, cut the upper mids, that's going to make something sound warmer, or, or even cut the highs, experiment with that. Because as soon as you start boosting here, there's a couple of problems if you boost the low mids. First of all, you're going to be adding to that mud. And secondly, you could be boosting, especially if you get a bit lower, you could be boosting particular notes. So a bass guitar, for example, um, a lot of the notes are between 60 and 100 if you're playing in the lower octave. So if you just boosted 100, you're going to be boosting certain notes and those notes are going to stick out a lot more. So first of all, if you are going to boost low mids or lows, make sure it's wide so you're not boosting particular notes. But generally, I recommend avoid uh, to avoid boosting between 2 and 400. And again, that seems obvious, but that's going to go a long way to, to preventing mud in your mix. And then number two is actually treating those problematic frequency areas on the individual channels themselves. So let me give you an example. On this vocal here, this EQ you see before you, uh, this is just a, a standard EQ. And what I'm doing on this band is cutting by one and a half dB at 281 hertz, so right in that mud range. And this does two things. First of all, it clears some of the mud from the vocal. It helps uh, the upper mids to shine through a bit more. It helps it to cut through the mix a bit more. But then secondly, it has that added benefit of it's also, because the vocal is gonna be one of the loudest things, that's gonna remove some of the mud from the overall mix as well. Let's have a listen in solo. I never normally EQ in solo, but just for the sake of demonstration, I'm gonna move this around. So I'm gonna start at zero and then I'm gonna pull this down um, quite far just so you can really hear the difference. And then I'm gonna go back to one and a half uh, so you can hear the the uh, cut that I actually ended on. Tell me, is this too much to handle? Conversation, don't know where to go. Feeling like a slow burning candle. The end is inevitable. Tell me what you're thinking. Cause I can't seem to... There you go, it just really clears it up. It makes more room. This goes back to those earlier techniques. It makes more room for the good stuff to shine through, which I spoke about in part one. So that's a great technique. A couple of other examples uh, on the bass guitar here. I'm cutting at 219 by quite a lot, 3.5 dB. Um, there'll, be, there'll be loads of examples of this on my mix. Of course, on the group buses as well. I'm gonna talk more about um, processing on group buses and on the mix bus in a later video. So that's technique number two, uh, removing mud on the channels themselves and on the group buses. Just remember that frequency range, two to 400, that's gonna be problematic. And then number three is actually removing that mud on the mix bus itself. So just loading up, uh, I've got, quite a lot of processing going on here, which I'm gonna talk all about in a later part in this series. But you can see here I'm cutting 2 dB, which is quite a lot for a, for a mix bus EQ at 317 hertz, so a bit higher this time. And even though I've got that processing on the individual channels, it wasn't quite enough. I've also got a cut on the mix bus itself. And I would have actually added this cut first. So I mix backwards. I start with the mix bus, then the group buses, then individual channels. So this is the first kind of mud cut that I would have added. And then obviously I felt when I was processing the vocals and the group buses, I had to remove even more. So let's demonstrate that as well. Again, I'm gonna start without it and then pull it down. Tell me, is this too much to handle? Conversation don't know where to go. Feeling like a slow burning candle. The end is inevitable. Tell me what you think. So you can really hear the difference there. The mix immediately opens up. You need to be careful because you might have heard there when I cut it by um, six to seven dBs, it does start to sound a bit weird. It starts to sound too scooped. And that's because the mid frequencies are still really important. Even the lower mids are really important because that's what our ears are most susceptible to. That's where most of the detail is. So if you remove them too much, it's gonna sound scooped and you're gonna lose a lot of that detail. So you want to keep it subtle. I reckon 2 dBs is probably about the most you're going to want to cut by unless you really know what you're doing. Generally on your mix bus you do want to be more subtle. 
So that's approach number three. So just to summarize those three key approaches, first of all, try not to boost in that problematic frequency range of two to 400. Secondly, treat that frequency range on individual channels. And then number three, treat that frequency range on the mix bus as well. And once you've done all of those things, it's gonna at least get rid of some of that mud. You can fix it with arrangement, think about that first, but if it's the typical rock band setup, you're probably not gonna be able to completely remove that problem uh, without EQ as well. So I hope you enjoyed that. This is part of a, a larger series about EQ called the One Month EQ Challenge. This is part three, we've got loads more to come up. My challenge for you as part of a, a series is to take a mix at the beginning of the month and then watch and read the eight tutorials that I'm gonna send you uh, completely free and then readdress that mix later on after you finish those and listen to the difference. Work on the arrangement, work on the EQ and then compare it to your old mix. And that's a really great thing to do. It's a really good way to boost your confidence and see how far you've come. So that's the one month EQ challenge. There's some cool bonuses as well. Uh, you get a private video about EQ and vocals. You can get my door templates uh, and you can also get my EQ uh, ebook that's quite popular. All you have to do is go to one month EQ and sign up there. Like I said, it's completely free. There's a link in the video now. There's a link in the description. I highly recommend you do that if you're not already part of it. In part four, we're going to address thin mixes and how you can make sure your mixes don't sound thin and what to do if they do and it's too late, um, how you can fix that. So I can't wait to share that with you. Don't forget to sign up for the challenge, subscribe on YouTube, like this video if you found it uh, helpful. If you've got any questions, please leave a comment and I'll see you in the next part.